And um, our primary focus today um, is we're going to be talking a lot about uh, reactions that occur in aqueous solution. And we're actually going to spend today on that. We're going to spend tomorrow on that as well, um, talking about two different types of reactions. Um, but the primary, the primary thing that we'll be doing is, is uh, reactions for the next two days. And then um, on Friday, we'll talk a little bit about solution concentration. We'll talk a little bit about um, some calculations that we can do uh, to kind of close up the chapter. Um, but today, today is going to be mostly about these types of reactions that occur. And to that end, the thing that we're going to have to ask ourselves, um, because it's something that we've kind of glossed over to this point, is how do we know a reaction actually occurs? Now, if we're doing a reaction or an experiment in the lab, then we have a number of ways of knowing. Um, we can look for um, heat transfers, you know, changes in temperature. We can look for the formation of a gas. We can look for the formation of a solid. We can look for, um, you know, is, is it going to effervesce? Is it going to bubble? Is it going to um change colors there, there are lots of things does it emit heat does it emit light those are all things that we can look for that give us an idea and some insight into whether or not a reaction has actually occurred but if i'm just looking at a chemical equation uh, let's say i have a reaction on a piece of paper how do i know that the reaction that is occurring actually occurs well, some of it we can take on faith and say, well, if it, go if it goes that way, then I assume it's going to occur. But if we're dealing with stuff in solution, it's not as easy as it sounds. Because if I take a solution, which has a whole bunch of ions or, or molecules dissolved in water, and I add to it another solution that has a whole bunch of ions or molecules dissolved in water, and I combine them together, what's to tell me that I don't make just a bigger solution with more ions dissolved in water, or if a reaction actually occurs? And so that's really the subject of today, is looking at two different types of reactions that leave behind markers of some kind to let us know that a reaction has occurred. And so to do these kinds of reactions, we're going to have to have a really good hold on our solubility rules. And so if you took some time last night and studied those, um, you're going to be in good shape today. If you didn't, that's okay. It, it's going to be a matter of time and practice. The more time and practice that you can put into this to get your solubility rules down so that you can recognize um, when reactions are occurring, the better off that we're going to be. But for right now, um, this is one of those critical parts of the semester today and tomorrow where if you don't understand the fundamental concept that's behind it, you're going to have a hard time completing the tasks ahead. So by all means, if you get stuck on something or you don't understand, stop me, ask me questions, and let me re-explain or, or review it with you again. Because if you don't do that, if you just kind of gloss it over and say, well, I'll catch that and I'll figure it out after lecture, you might but it's gonna take you a lot longer than if you just asked a question in the first place. So today we're gonna to be talking about precipitation and acid-base reactions. Now with precipitation reactions, these are reactions that have a solid product that forms from a reaction in solution. So 
these are the reactions that I put us I put a solution together with another solution and when I combine them together I get a new solution but I also get a solid forming on the bottom of that solution and so how we identify these by name um, obviously if we're doing in the in the lab we can identify them by site um, but usually we can identify these by using our solubility rules So in this particular example, we are told that the silver nitrate is aqueous, which means that it's dissolved in water. We're told that the sodium chloride is aqueous, which means it's dissolved in water. We're told that the sodium nitrate is aqueous, which means it's dissolved in water. And the silver chloride here is a solid, which indicates that it is not dissolved in the water. Now, if I didn't have these labels, if I just had the substances, I should still be able to look at these and go, okay, nitrates are always soluble, so that's a soluble salt. Um, sodium compounds are always soluble, so that's a soluble salt. Sodium and nitrate are always soluble, so that's a soluble salt. Chlorides are usually soluble, but silver is one of the exceptions. That's how I get this insoluble product. Now, the formation of these precipitates, um, like I said, the solubility rules really seem, will really help us with this. And to get it down to its bare essence, so in this reaction equation, what we have here is a lot of fluff. We have a lot of extraneous information here because many of the substances that are in this equation don't actually do anything. The nitrate ion went from in solution as a reactant to in solution as a product. The sodium ion went from in solution as a reactant to in solution as a product. So if it started in solution and it ends in solution, the end result is that it didn't change. Nothing happened to it. It is exactly the same as it was at the beginning. And so what a net ionic equation does is says, forget all that stuff. Take out all the stuff that's extraneous. Take out all the stuff that doesn't do anything. And let's focus on the essence of the reaction itself. That is what actually occurs, what is actually happening. And so from that standpoint, Net ionic equations give us kind of the nuts and bolts. Here is what happens in this reaction, no more, no less. Now, on the other hand, we have neutralization reactions. Neutralization reactions occur when we have acids and bases interacting with each other. And the net result is that we get a salt and water. Now that's what happens in a neutralization reaction. We're actually going to pull back a little bit and look at acid-base reactions in general, which gets into our identification of our Bronsted-Lowry theory that I alluded to yesterday. But in a neutralization reaction, we can look at this and say, okay, here's what's happening. I've got an acid, hydrochloric acid, reacting with a base, sodium hydroxide, and the net result is I get sodium chloride, which is a salt, an ionic compound, and water. Now, depending upon the, um, depending upon what's going on with these, um, are, we can use net ionic equations to kind of distill them down to their essences as well. Because if I look at these, I see hydrochloric acid is a strong acid, so it's going to be ions in solution. Sodium hydroxide is a strong base, so it's going to be ions in solution. 
and sodium chloride is soluble in water. So it's going to be ions in solution. And so there are parts here that are also kind of standing around doing nothing. It happens to be, in this case, the, the components of the salt that really don't have a whole lot to do with the reaction itself. They just happen to be there in the solutions at the time that the reaction occurred. So before we move into ionic and net ionic equations, Let's take a look at some general reactions that can occur that are acid base and how we can identify them as acid and base. So in the reaction that we just did, The acid base character of this reaction is relatively easy because if we use our, our guidelines, what we've been using so far to identify acids and bases, it's pretty easy to see that this is a, this is an acid because we've got the hydrogen ion first and that this is a base because we've got the, the hydroxide ion here at the end. And then the neutralization reaction occurs like that. What about reactions like this? Now you wouldn't look at it at first, but this is actually an acid-base reaction. Now, under the Bronsted-Lowry theory, one of these is an acid and one of these is a base. The question is which one is which? Well, under Bronsted theory, acids donate H plus ions and bases accept H plus ions. So of these two, which one is giving away an H plus? If it's not obvious immediately, sometimes an easy way to look at this is to pair up the things that are alike. Okay, so in orange here, I've got the ammonia molecule and the ammonium ion. The difference between them is that the ammonia has added one H plus ion. How do I know that? Well, I can look and see that from NH3 to NH4 plus, the difference between these two is H plus. On the flip side, to go from water to hydroxide, I had to lose and H plus. If I add H plus to hydroxide, I would get water. So under these definitions and following this kind of logic, the acid in this particular reaction is my water 
And ammonia in this particular case is my base. Because it comes back to these concepts of Bronsted Lowry acid base theory. Bases accept hydrogens, acids donate hydrogens. So let's take a look at another example. CH3OH reacts with water to make H3O plus and CH3O negative one. Now I can do the same kind of pairings that I saw in the previous example problem. The CH3OH and the CH3O minus are similar. the H2O and the H3O plus are similar. How are they different? Well, in this case, the water has added an H plus and the CH3OH has lost an H plus. So under our definitions, the loss of an H plus, the donation of an H plus would make CH3OH an acid, and the gaining of an H plus would make the water a base. So this version of acid-base theory, Bronsted-Lowry acid-base theory, allows us to extend our definitions of acid and base beyond does it have a, an H at the beginning or an OH at the end? Is it ionic looking or is it not ionic looking? And in the cases of these that we just did, where neither of the, none of the substances look ionic. You know, you might've been fooled by the OH group here on the methanol, but that's not actually a hydroxide group. Um, this is a molecular compound. These are all covalently bonded together. And so from that perspective, this has the capability, this actually acts like an acid and gives that H plus away and the water acts like a base. And in the previous example, the water acted like an acid. And so because water kind of has this dualistic nature, There's a term for that. It's called amphiprotic. Um, sometimes you hear it referred to as amphoterism. Um, but what it means is that depending upon the situation, water can act as an acid or as a base. And we see this in other kinds of scenarios as well. Um, if I put, for example, um, the carbon, the bicarbonate ion, H3O minus one, and I react it with water, I can see that it could act as an acid, donating that proton, that hydrogen to the carbonate and becoming the, or excuse me, donating that uh, proton to the water and becoming the carbonate ion. 
but it can also act as a base, or excuse me, as an acid, uh, can also act as a base where where it accepts that proton and actually in this case carbonic acid rarely exists as that particular molecule what happens more often than not is that it'll break down into carbon dioxide and water And this reaction in particular is the reaction that takes place in most baked goods. Um, if you use baking powder, um, which usually has um, a, a cream of tartar or some other kind of acidic component to it, or just plain old baking soda, uh, baking soda is sodium bicarbonate. And if you interact it with any kind of acidic medium in your baked goods, um, whether that be the acidity of the other ingredients, you know, buttermilk or, or what have you, that is responsible for generating the bubbles um, that make bread, um, muffins, biscuits, whatever you're doing, um, that much more light and airy. Um, that's where you get the bubbles that form in things like cakes and, and other things that make them light. Um, and it's this reaction itself. You've got the bicarbonate reacting with whatever acid is, is, is in the mix, forming the carbon dioxide bubbles as it reacts um, inside. Now, not every baked good does this. Um, some use yeast and use yeast as the source of the carbon dioxide bubbles um, as the yeasts break down sugar. Um, but if you're talking about quick breads, um, those that do not use yeast um, or cakes that don't use yeast, um, this is this is what happens in those. And and again, the 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 way that we can identify the acid-base behavior is based upon what happens. The hydrogen, uh, the bicarbonate ion here has lost an H plus, so we know that it's an acid. The water here has gained the H plus, so it's, an, it's a base. In this example, we have the bicarbonate is gaining an H plus. So we know it's acting as a base. The hydronium ion here, H3O plus, is acting as an acid and it shows as it is giving away that H plus to make water. So any questions about Bronsted theory um, as far as identifying acids and bases in chemical reactions? No. Okay, so with that information in play, let's look at ionic equations. Now, as I was saying before, molecular equations do not tell the full story. And the reason why we can say that they don't tell the full story is because in ionic reactions, in these reactions that are occurring in solutions, I've got a solution full of dissolved stuff and another solution full of dissolved stuff. And just because I combine those doesn't necessarily mean that I get a reaction to occur. 
I couldn't end up having just a bigger solution full of dissolved stuff. So ionic equations help me to decipher what is going on when I combine those solutions with each other. Because we're gonna use our solubility rules, we're gonna use our electrolyte um, characteristics to help us to figure out what actually is being combined when we combine those substances. And based upon our ionic equation, we'll be able to see if anything changed. And if nothing changed, then we know that a reaction didn't actually occur. But if something does change from a molecular standpoint, from an ionic standpoint, then we know that we've got, that we're on to something and that we have something to examine further. So here's our process. To turn an, a molecular equation into an ionic equation, there's a process we have to follow. The first thing that we have to do is we have to have the molecular equation. Now I'm gonna add a little note here. The molecular equation needs to be balanced. If it's not balanced, then everything that we do in these succeeding steps is gonna be confusing or not helpful. If it's balanced, then we're gonna have a good idea of how to fix it. But if it's unbalanced, then we're not gonna get a lot of information out of these ionic equations. The second step, now that we have our balanced molecular equation, we need to identify the reaction species by type. And what I mean by that is the same kind of evaluations that you're doing in the proficiency for number five. Acid, base, salt. It's one of those three. And then from there, is it a soluble salt or an insoluble salt? Is it a strong acid or a weak acid? Is it a strong base or a weak base? Those are the designations. So one of six designations is gonna be put on each reacting species in the equation. And for every one of those types that is a strong electrolyte, and so there are three of them, the soluble salt, the strong acid, the strong base. If it's one of those three, then we're gonna split it up into its ions for the ionic equation. That's how the ionic equation gets its name. It's the splitting up into ions for those substances. So for example, sodium chloride, it's a soluble salt. It's gonna split up into its ions. So it splits up into sodium plus ion, it splits up into chloride minus ion. Everything else, whether it's a weak electrolyte, like a weak base, or a weak acid, or a non-electrolyte, like uh, an insoluble salt, water, a gas, um, all of those would get left in their molecular forms. So that's how we write an ionic equation. Now there's one more thing that we can do to help to clarify the reactions themselves. And that is something called a net ionic equation. Net ionic equations are going to have, take advantage of the fact that most of the ionic equations we look at are gonna have common ions on each side of the reaction. Now the ones that are common on each side, those are the ones that did not react we call them spectator ions. And so spectator ions are ones that, since they don't react, they need to be removed. Because the net ionic equation really is the telling of the story of the reaction. I put this together with this, and they reacted with each other, and this was the product. And so what the net ionic equation tells us is what happened. And if there's nothing in the net ionic equation, because the ionic equation was completely full of spectators, then that tells us that a reaction didn't actually occur. 
and that we just have a big old solution now uh, with much, much more stuff mixed in and layered in. So let's take a look at some examples. First example here. I've got lead to nitrate reacting with sodium iodide to make sodium nitrate and lead to iodide. Now, from this perspective, we can already see that it's balanced. So step one is complete. For step two, we need to identify the substances based upon their type. So for lead to nitrate, I can already tell that it's a, that it's a salt. The question is, is it a soluble salt or an insoluble salt? This is where our solubility rules come in. I've got a nitrate ion. Nitrate ions are always soluble. So I'm going to classify lead to nitrate as a soluble salt. One down, four, three to go. Sodium iodide. Again, metal and nonmetal, it's going to be a salt. Is it soluble or insoluble? Well, sodium ion is always soluble. So it goes from there. Salt here again, sodium nitrate. Sodium and nitrate are always soluble, so that's a soluble salt also. And then finally, I've got my lead to iodide. I can recognize I got a metal, sodium, or excuse me, um, lead, mixing with iodide. So I know this is a salt. Now I gotta go to my solubility rules. Solubility rules say that iodide ion is usually soluble in water, but it has three exceptions attached, silver, mercury one, and lead. Since lead is one of those exceptions, I know that I'm dealing with an exception here. That's gonna make this an insoluble salt. So for my ionic equation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out all of the ions from all of the strong electrolytes. So anything that says soluble salt, strong acid, or strong base, I'm going to split apart. And so to that end, I'm going to have a lead ion, Pb plus 2. I'm going to have nitrate ion. Now, note that our stoichiometry rules are going to apply. So if I have subscripts around ions or coefficients around compounds, they are going to apply to everything. So my subscript of two tells me I have two nitrate ions here. My coefficient here tells me I have two sodium ions. And two iodide ions and on the other side again I've got two sodium ions and two nitrate ions. And so that covers all of my solubles. Lead iodide, lead to iodide here is insoluble, so I leave it in its molecular form. Just like that. 
So there's my ionic equation. Everything that is soluble gets split into its ions. Everything that is insoluble gets left in its molecular form. The last step is identifying my spectator ions. So are there ions that are common to both sides of this equation? I can look at this and say, okay, wait, I've got nitrate on both sides, two nitrates on both sides, in fact. So those will cross out. And I've got two sodiums on each side. So those will cross out as well. And so the net ionic equation would be just the lead ion and the two iodide ions making the lead to iodide solid. So that's how we can take a molecular equation and really break it down into its essence. When I combine the lead iodide with, or excuse me, when I combine the lead to nitrate with the sodium iodide and I put them all together, what ultimately happens is that the lead ions find the iodide ions and they come together to make lead to iodide. Other than that, pretty much nothing else changes. All right. Any questions on this example? No. All right, let's do another example here. I've got silver nitrate reacting with potassium chloride to make silver chloride and potassium nitrate. So again, I start by looking at the solubility rules and identifying and classifying these. So all of these are salts, none of these are acids or bases. So from that standpoint, I look at it and go, okay, this one has a nitrate, so it is a soluble salt. This one has an alkali metal. So potassium, it's a soluble salt. Um, chlorides are usually soluble, but silver is one of the exceptions. So that's an insoluble salt. And potassium and nitrate are always soluble. So that's a soluble salt as well. My ionic equation I'm going to have breaking this apart now silver ion reacting with nitrate ion. Oof, got away from me there. Reacting with the nitrate ion, NO3 minus. This one splits as well, so potassium ion and chloride ion to make silver chloride is insoluble, so it stays as silver chloride. It does not split apart. And then finally, Potassium nitrate is soluble, so it does split apart. A plus and NO3 minus. So there's my ionic equation. To turn ionic into 
net ionic. I have to identify some spectators. So I start looking and I see, okay, I've got nitrate on each side. I've got potassium on each side. Those are my spectator ions. Those are going to go away. And so all that's left at the end of this is silver ion reacts with chloride ion to make silver chloride. Right. Any questions here? No. No. Okay. Instead of me turning this one over to you directly, let's go ahead and let's talk through this one together. So, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you to help me fill in the blanks and uh, to draw out the ionic and net ionic equations. Um, so, we've got an equation. We can see that it's been balanced for us. Let's start identifying the uh, substances here by type. So ammonium sulfate. Soluble. Okay, soluble salt. Barium chloride. Soluble. Soluble salt. Barium sulfate. Soluble. Wait, no, it's insoluble. Okay, why? Because of the barium and the sulfate. If they're together, it's one of the exceptions. Yes. Sulfates are usually soluble, but barium is one of the exceptions. Remember the exceptions for the... Uh, for the, for the sulfate are your heavy alkaline earth metals. So your, your calciums, your strontiums, your bariums, and the same ones that are the chloride exceptions, your lead two, your mercury one, and your silver. Um, uh, excuse me, your, your lead two and your mercury one, silver's, silver's not one of them. Um, so we have in here, this is insoluble. Okay, last one, the ammonium chloride. Soluble. Also soluble. Okay, all right, um, somebody else um, fill me in. Now that we've identified the four compounds here, what, is the ionic, what does that ionic equation look like? So. Somebody give me the breakdown for our first solid, or our first uh, salt here. One sec. Laws, do you have it? The net ionic. 
Well, no, no. So how does I mean, that's the, ionic, the ionic itself? So how does how does ammonium sulfate break down? NH four plus um, plus SO four two minus. Um, plus Ea plus two. Okay. Okay. Hold. Hold on. Let's. There is something wrong with how we did this. Mm. Can Can we figure out what we've done wrong with the ammonium sulfate? Does it have to do with the charges? Charges are good. Ammonium is a positive one. Sulfate is a negative two. That, that is correct. Yeah. I'm missing something. I don't know. What's that mean? Yeah. The two goes in the front of the NH4. Yes. Remember, subscripts are going to turn into coefficients. Right. And coefficients are going to multiply coefficients, uh, are going to drag over both ions. So I had to have the two here to represent the two ammoniums that would be there to balance out the negative two charge on the sulfate. OK? Okay, so now that we've got that out of the way, um, we had barium. Um, what's the charge on the barium? Plus one. Plus Cl. Or two Cl. Um, minus one. Okay. Okay, well, let's stop again real quick. Because we've made a mistake in here Barium as well. is a two, my, two plus, my bad. Yes, yes. So, um, for the main group elements, especially, you know, or any of them for that matter, we need to have charge balance in our molecules. So we know that the chloride is a negative one. We know that there are two of them. The barium has to be a positive two. Barium is also an alkaline earth metal. Alkaline earth metals are always positive two. Um, so we've got the reactant side taken care of. Let's look at the product side. What is, give me the breakdown for the barium sulfate. BA2 plus plus SO42. All right, let's I stop mean, here again. Why did we go through all of that at the beginning? If this is insoluble, it didn't dissolve in water. If it didn't dissolve in water, then it doesn't break apart into ions in water. If we identify something as insoluble, or a liquid, or a gas, or a weak acid or a weak base, if it's not a strong electrolyte, it's going to stay together in our equation. So this is going to be barium sulfate, BaSO4. It does not ionize because it is not dissolved. 
Okay, last part. Um, 2NH4 minus, I mean plus, plus 2Cl minus. Okay. And this time we're correct. So to go from ionic to net ionic, we need to identify spectators. We need to identify L um, substances that are common on both sides of the equation. Um, let's see, Chasney, can I pick on you here? Um, can you identify one of the spectators? Yes. Okay, so uh, if you're not following along in the chat, Chasney has identified the chloride ion as a spectator ion, and that is correct. It is common on both sides. Okay. Um, can you identify the other one, Chasney? Yes, again. Um, ammonia. Uh, excuse me, ammonium ion is the other spectator ion. So we've identified the spectator ions in this case. All we need to do now is simply rewrite, leaving out the spectators. So that would leave us with sulfate ion, SO4 minus two, and barium ion, BA plus two, and BASO4 as the product. And so that's all it is. That's all it is. So probably the most difficult step, um, because if you know your solubility rules, this isn't too bad to do this first step here. The hardest step is this one in the middle where I have to go from this information up top to the ionic equation down below. And the reason why it's so difficult is because there are a number of places to make mistakes along the way. Um, we can split the ions incorrectly. We can forget our coefficients like we did here initially. We can forget that we identified something as a non-electrolyte and split it up anyway. We can assign things incorrect charges. So there are lots of mistakes that can go along the way. Um, and if we do any of those mistakes, it usually throws off our net ionic equation because let's just say for the sake of argument here that you only applied this two to the ammonia, the ammonium, but not to the chloride. Well, if that was the case, then would the chlorides truly cancel? Well, in a sense, this chloride would go away, but I'd only lose one of these. Two would come down to one. I'd end up with an extra chloride here that wasn't over here anywhere. And so if you find yourself looking at that kind of a situation where you go, okay, well, hon, that's funny, that doesn't make sense. Why do I have extra things on the reactant side compared to the product side? Or why are there more products than reactants? That's a really good sign that you've made a mistake somewhere and that you need to go back and fix it before you try to rationalize it the rest of the way. What happens far too often is that students get to that spot, they go, huh, that doesn't make any sense. 
and then they proceed to ignore it. Or they go, oh, well, um, maybe it's supposed to be there. And they just leave it in, and you end up with an equation like this that doesn't obey the law of conservation of matter. So being really diligent and making sure that you have all of your ideas kind of lined up and, and ready to go is a really important part of this, um, this exercise. Any questions right now? No. Okay, no, no, Chasney, it, it is, it is two CL minus. Uh, I was, I was making a point. The two does come over both of them. So they did cancel out. My point was more along the lines of if you had made that mistake, then the chlorides wouldn't have fully canceled out and you would have had leftovers. And that should have been a telltale sign from you hey, I made a mistake. All right, let's do this last one. And um, would you rather walk through it together or do you wanna to try to do it yourself? by ourselves okay all right go go ahead and try to try to run through it now this one is unbalanced so make sure that you balance it out first and then once you've balanced it out go ahead and and do the ionic do the net ionic see what you can come up with um and uh we'll we'll take a look at it uh about five minutes from now, and then uh, we'll go ahead and take a break. So go ahead and uh, start working. All right, let's let's check in, see how we're doing. So I've got the designations. Sodium chloride was a soluble salt. Um, Barium hydroxide, okay, uh, this is our first example where we've had to deal with um, acids or bases. And so we don't identify them as soluble or insoluble. We identify them based on their strength. Barium and sodium are both on our strong bases list. So we have classified them as strong bases. And barium chloride, chloride ions are usually soluble. Barium is not one of the exceptions. So this is a soluble salt as well. And so if I break it down now, I've got two sodium ions and two chloride ions. And the barium ion. and two hydroxide ions. What did you say the SB stands for again? Strong base. Okay. And so remember for ionic equations, any strong electrolyte gets broken apart. So a strong base, a strong acid or a soluble salt would get broken into ions here. So I've got a strong base here, which means I've got two sodium ions and two hydroxide ions. And I've got a soluble salt here, so I've got the barium ion. and two chloride ions. 
And so let's pick out our spectator ions. Right. Anybody, give me a spectator ion out of this. The barium. Okay, barium ion is present on both sides, so it's a spectator. And uh, CL. Chloride is a spectator. It's present on both sides. Isn't everything on both sides? Salt yeah. and the, yeah. 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 Sodium is present on both sides. Hydroxide is present on both sides. What do we do when everything's a spectator? Well, it's pretty simple. Oh, because nothing happened. Everything just stayed the same, there, basically. Yeah, there's no reaction. Okay. Everything that was here at the beginning is here at the end. There's been no rearrangement. There's been no. Um, there's been no restructuring of the bonds. There's been no reattack. There's been nothing new. Everything that was there before is there after. This is no reaction. So, um, we can write it out this way. We can say NR for no reaction. The bottom line is the net ionic equation is blank. There's no reaction, nothing happened. And so this is a possibility, um, especially when we're dealing with things that are, that have, that are really electrolytic if I put everything together and I'm left with exactly the same electro, well, uh, electrolytic character that I had before, nothing changed. Um, now, it's equally possible. I do want to warn you about this. It is equally possible that my total ionic and net ionic would be exactly the same also. Where I look at my reactants on the ionic equation and nothing there are no spectators everything's different on the product side and if that's the case the ionic and the net ionic are the, exactly the same they're the same reaction so both are possible um albeit somewhat unlikely um not to say that you won't see anything like that but Generally speaking, there are usually one or two spectator ions, um, depending upon the reaction that's taking place. So let's take a break. Uh, let's come back at 1025 and we'll finish up uh, ionic equations and we'll just dip our toes a little bit into uh, redox reactions, which will be tomorrow's uh, subject material. So uh, uh, come back in about 10 minutes or so. All right, so we're going to switch gears in the last half of this uh, lecture and talk about redox uh, reactions and, and some redox terms. This is going to help set us up for tomorrow. This is also going to help you with that uh, post-lecture activity that, where you have to review net ionic equations and, and uh, assign oxidation numbers, which is uh, coming due uh, either tonight or tomorrow night. Um, now, as far as redox and those kinds of reactions are concerned, an oxidation reduction reaction, otherwise known as a redox reaction, is any kind of a reaction where electrons are being transferred from one substance to another. And in particular, we really get into the fine details of one element is passing electrons to another element in, in redox reactions. Now, redox or oxidation reduction is the combination of two 
processes occurring simultaneously. On one hand, we have oxidation. Oxidation is the process by which a reactant, an element, gives away electrons. And that oxidative process involves an element in some sort of compound, in some sort of ion, some sort of substance, losing its electrons. Now, while it is losing its electrons, something on the other end is happening. The reaction where the loss of electrons is being matched by a reaction where electrons are gained by another element. And that process is called reduction. So oxidation is the loss of electrons. Reduction is the gain of electrons. And the two processes happen simultaneously. The thing that loses electrons gives its electrons to the thing that gains electrons. And so one process cannot occur without the other. Both have to occur and they both occur simultaneously. Now, as you might expect with something, with anything that's new, it's easy to get confused. And with something that is as nuanced as oxidation reduction reactions are, it can be very easy to get oxidation confused with reduction and vice versa especially when we start to try to characterize some of the, the reactants as either oxidizing agents and reducing agents, which throws a little bit more uh, confusion into the gumbo. There is a way to, there are a couple of ways, a couple of mnemonics out there that are out there to help you remember and keep them straight. One of them is the ogre. Uh, this is actually the one I learned when I was in high school. Um, I've used it um, pretty much consistently since then, um, and it's, uh, it's a simple acronym, LEOGER. The loss of electrons is oxidation. The gain of electrons is reduction. LEO the lion goes GER. Um, and as stupid as that sounds, I've been doing chemistry now for 20 plus years. I still remember that LEO the lion goes GER. Um, there's another one out there called oil rig. Now, um, I did not learn it in high school. Obviously, I learned the ogre. I picked that one up in college um, when I was, um, you know, taking chemistry as a as a freshman in college, and um, somebody I was studying with said, "Oh yeah, uh, this is easy. You, you just use oil rig." I just stared and go, "What the heck's oil rig?" Oh well. Oil rig is, um, oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain. Um, so there are, there are ways to learn this. And, and again, the thing with mnemonic devices is that they're stupid. They're designed to be stupid. They're designed to be something that you can easily remember. And both of these are stupid, but they're easy to remember. And if you can remember what they stand for, it'll be easier to keep track of which one is which in your mind. As far as which one you use, I don't care. They both work. Um, it's really a matter of personal preference. Um, and, um, you know, just, just how silly you wanna look when you're trying to remember it. The, the ogre. Uh, but when it comes to these kinds of reactions, the way that we can tell a oxidation reduction reaction is occurring is by tracking whether or not electrons are moving. And whether or not electrons are moving is not as easy as just looking at something and saying, oh, well, the charge over there is more than the charge over here. Or the charge over here is the same as the charge over there. It's a lot more nuanced than that. Um, and so what we use to help us with this, to help us to track the reaction progress and whether or not oxidation and reduction are occurring are through the use of oxidation numbers. Now oxidation numbers are kind of like when we talked about formal charge. When we talked about formal charge, we talked about the idea of an individual charge on an element in a compound at that particular time. And that's kind of along the same lines of what oxidation numbers are. Oxidation numbers tell us the particular charge 
on an element in a compound or an ion at that particular time. Now, what's different about oxidation numbers versus formal charges is that oxidation numbers can be, be applied to any species. And uh, it does not have to be covalently bonded. And the other thing is that they are different from formal charges because formal charges get us into you know, how many electrons are bonded, how many lone pairs you have, all that stuff. Oxidation numbers take into account factors like electronegativity and just how well those electrons are actually held by that particular element. So in the event of something like, um, you know, something like uh, what we see in uh, a polyatomic ion that has very polar bonds, even though we think of the bonds as being, or the electrons as being around that center atom, if the bonds are particularly polar, we know that the electrons aren't actually there. <coughs> Excuse me. We know that the electrons aren't actually there around that center atom all the time. In fact, we know rather that the electrons are going to spend more time around the other electronegative centers and less time around that center atom. And so uh, oxidation number actually takes that into consideration and provides a more accurate picture of what the charge actually is like on that center atom. So it's kind of like formal charge, but there are some pretty strict differences between them. And so the way to track these is not by drawing the molecules and figuring out the charges, but rather by doing some rather simple calculations. And the simple calculations go as far as this. There are some guidelines that we can use to assign oxidation numbers to one substance or another. The first guideline is that if I take all of the oxidation numbers for all of the substances, or all the elements in a substance and add them together, that they will equal the total charge on the element, the compound, or the ion. This is very similar to what we saw in formal charges. If I took the formal charges of all the different elements in the, in the substance, added them together, they would equal the charge on the ion or zero if it was a molecule. Because of this, we're able to say some things pretty definitively. First of all, if we have an atom in its elemental form, we know its oxidation number is going to be zero. Because even if it is a molecular element like oxygen, O2, or phosphorus, P4, if it has no charge overall, and the charge is evenly distributed amongst all of the elements in that sample, then they all have to be zeros. So if I have oxygen with two oxygen atoms, zero charge overall, I can't say that this one's positive one and this one's negative one. They're both zero. The, the overall charge averages out over all of them. And the same thing for P4. If all four of those phosphoruses add up to zero, then it must be because it's zero plus zero plus zero plus zero and not plus two plus negative one plus negative one plus zero or any kind of weird combination. Everything has to be consistent. Otherwise, how would we even know that something is gaining or losing electrons if all of the oxidation numbers for all of the different elements are the same? The other thing that we can know definitively is that if I have a monatomic ion, whether it's a positive ion or a negative ion, the charge on that ion is its oxidation number. So barium ion, Ba plus two, has an oxidation number of positive two. Chloride ion, Cl minus, has an oxidation number of negative one. So atoms in their elemental form, so elements have an oxidation number of zero. Monatomic ions, that is one ion, or one element ions, uh, one, one atom ions, are going to have the same charge as their oxidation number. Second guideline, because of electronegativity, 
there are some elements that are always going to have the same oxidation number. So fluorine, for example. Fluorine is the most electronegative element on the periodic table. Fluorine, unless it is by itself, in which case it would have an oxidation number of zero, unless it's by itself, it's going to have an oxidation number of negative one. Oxygen. Oxygen is the second most electronegative element. It's going to have an oxidation number of negative two, unless, one, a couple of things. If it's bonded to fluorine, fluorine is going to supersede it. Uh, so um, molecules like OF2, oxygen actually has a pretty rare positive two state associated with it. Oxygen, elemental oxygen, obviously is going to have an oxidation number of zero. And peroxides, peroxides are kind of the rare circumstance where we have a negative two charge shared by two electrons. And so they average out to one negative H. Aside from that, pretty straightforward. The last thing that we can bank on is that hydrogen, hydrogen when it is bonded to nonmetals, is going to have a positive one charge. Hydrogen when bonded to metals and forming metal hydrides is always going to have a negative one charge. So it's either going to be positive one or negative one or zero if it's elemental hydrogen. So those three elements, um, two of which are extremely common elements that we find in lots of compounds, are going to have pretty consistent guidelines, pretty consistent oxidation states. The rest follows a relatively simple algebra formula and comes back to this idea of number one. All the oxidation numbers in an element of an element or a compound have to add up to the total charge. So if I know the charge and I know the elemental or excuse me, the oxidation numbers of every element except for one, I can use algebra to solve for the remaining element. So let's take a look at some examples. In these examples, we can see that oxygen is negative two and sulfur is positive four. How did we arrive at that conclusion? Well, it comes down to we have to do something with our algebra here. We know that sulfur plus two times oxygen, because there are two oxygen atoms, is gonna have to equal out to zero because there is no charge on sulfur dioxide here. Keeping in mind that oxygen is usually negative two unless it's one of these special circumstances, I can continue my algebra, sulfur plus two times negative two is equal to zero. Negative two times two is negative four. Sulfur plus negative four is zero. Sulfur must be positive four. So I can assign an oxidation number of positive four for the sulfur, negative two for the oxygen. Now, common mistake that students make is assuming that um, this multiplication, the negative two times zero, the negative two times negative two, whatever the case may be, that that total is the oxidation state of the element. So I get a lot of uh, negative fours in the case of oxygen for sulfur dioxide, and that's not the case. It's a total charge of negative four spread over two atoms. So negative four divided by two would be negative two for the oxygen. I can use a similar line of logic for the chromium. So I've got a chromium 
I've got four oxygens. And that's going to give me a total charge of negative two. Again, oxygen is usually negative two. So I've got chromium, four times negative two is negative eight. Chromium minus eight is negative two. So chromium must be positive six. So I've got a positive six state for the chromium. I've got a negative two state for the oxygen. And those are my oxidation numbers there. All right, let's look at the next one. I've got nitrogen plus three hydrogens is equal to zero because there's no charge on the ammonia. I don't know nitrogen, but I know that when hydrogen is bonded to nonmetals like hydrogen, it's a positive one charge. So if I follow the algebra through to its natural conclusion, I get a negative three for the nitrogen. And so my numbers, negative three for nitrogen, positive one for hydrogen. Let's look now at the uh, chlorine ion, ClO3. I've got chlorine plus three oxygen is equal to negative one. Again, oxygen is usually negative two. So that means that I've got chlorine plus negative six to equal negative one, chlorine must be positive five. And so I can draw a positive five here and a negative two for the oxygen. All right, why don't you try these last two by yourself? Um, and uh, see, see where that takes you. Could you go back to the previous slide real quick? Sure. Thank you.
All right, how are we looking? We done. Okay, so what did you get as the oxidation state for the sulfur in SF6? Um, positive six. Okay, correct. And for the fluorine in SF6? Negative six. Okay, so this is the, this is the problem I was describing up here. In total, oh. Sorry. It's negative six. Negative for one. Fluorine. For each fluorine, it's just negative one. Remember, when we assign oxidation numbers, we're talking about individual atoms, not collective. So it's a total charge of negative six, but each one is negative one. Okay, what about the chlorine here? Would that be zero? It would be zero. Okay. Now, if you read that as CI2, um, probably would have a hard time figuring that one out because um, we don't have any guidelines around those. Um, but this is actually chlorine Cl2. And so if we just did the algebra around that, two times chlorine is equal to zero. Well, then chlorine has to be zero. Okay. Any questions about oxidation numbers? No. No. Okay. So this is where we're going to stop for today. Um, when we pick up again tomorrow, we will actually start using these oxidation numbers uh, to start to identify when redox reactions occur. And then we'll actually start to use them to help us to balance redox reactions, which is the last part of, of this block of the chapter. Um, like I said, there's a quantitative block that comes after this where we'll talk about solution concentrations and reactions and solution. And we'll, we'll cover that mostly on Friday. Um, but the, the, probably the more difficult part of this chapter is what's in front of us right now. Um, and so we'll uh, we'll hit that uh, we'll hit that when it when it comes up uh, tomorrow.